Are you suffering from lack of power when you're going up hills? Or is your car suffering from a check engine light on where it might be giving you a P0101 or a 171 and a 174? Is it possible that it might be your mass airflow sensor? If you're unsure, make sure you stick around and let me share with you how a mass airflow sensor works and some of the common tests that you can actually run. Since we're on a mission to better the automotive industry one technician at a time, and this starts with you, make sure you guys give us a thumbs up and subscribe so this way you guys are constantly notified anytime we drop a new video. And if and there's a certain thing you wanna learn, make sure you guys put it in the comments so this way we can make a video to keep helping you out. This, this is, is how we're gonna work together to better the automotive industry one technician at a time. The good old mass airflow. The mass airflow usually has a misconception of what it actually does. So the mass airflow's responsibility is what we call a high priority sensor. What this means is the computer is going to be looking at the actual mass airflow to determine how much incoming air the system's actually receiving. Then it's going to compare that to the oxygen sensors or the air fuel ratio sensors in the exhaust to then confirm if the right amount of air came in and if it was all consumed during the internal combustion process. Being that the mass airflow is that one sensor that's going to tell the computer how much air was coming in, we consider that part of the load and speed system. What that's in telling you is that the computer is going to look at throttle application and compare that to the mass airflow to then determine how much fuel and how much to advance or retard ignition timing. The mass airflow sensor is also known as a high priority sensor. What this is telling you is that if you have a problem with the mass airflow, the PCM or the engine controller should automatically set an actual code for it. One of the biggest problems we see with mass airflows is not always are you gonna get a P0101 for mass airflow performance. In some instances, you might get a P0171 or 174, which is bank one or bank two system lean. Like with many electronic components on cars, either sensors or actuators, they're not all a one size fits all. Different manufacturers use different styles of mass airflow sensors, including a hot wire, or a vortex style mass airflow. Now, if you're dealing with some of the older cars, uh, like some of the Toyotas, you might see that some of these Toyotas have what we call a vein mass airflow. These are more of a mechanical type and they're gonna have a little vein door or a blend door. As airflow flows through the mass airflow, this door is going to lift and that door is attached to a potentiometer. And that potentiometer is gonna vary a voltage, let the computer know how much incoming air, then the computer makes its adjustments for the air fuel control. If you're dealing with one of the newer airflow meter styles, it might be a hot wire system. The way this works is the engine computer is going to be supplying a small amount of current into a thermistor. This thermistor, just like any other thermistor, is a temperature style sensor. Depending on the amount of current the PCM has to apply to that particular sensor is how the computer determines how much airflow is actually coming in, passing that actual airflow that thermistor is going to cool down as more airflow comes in, and thus, that's why we call it a hot wire style sensor. The other type you might be seeing is a vortex style. What a vortex style mass airflow is, is this one's going to be working on a frequency. Depending on the style of car you might be working on, the frequency might vary anywhere between 2,000 to 5,000 kilohertz at idle, and always increase as RPM increases. Always make sure when you guys are going to be testing a mass airflow, look up the specs on the particular car you're dealing with. And if you don't have the spec, one thing that I always do is I'll go on any service information and look up a P0101. This is a mass airflow performance code. Thus, if you look it up, there's usually a section there that gives you operation description. Plus, it's also going to give you what the value should be of that particular sensor. This way, you're not using a one-size-fits-all approach when it comes time to actually check your mass airflow. When it comes time to actually test or visually inspect your mass airflow because you think it might be bad, there's a couple of things you want to pay attention to. If you guys notice on this mass airflow, we have our intake boot, and then we have another boot that comes in on this side. If for some reason on the engine side of the mass airflow, if the hose comes off, or we have any type of vacuum leak, we call that unmetered air. The reason we call that that is because the mass airflow has already, already read how much air is coming through. So this extra air that's coming in is coming in after the sensor, thus it's unmetered air. 
When you have those types of situations, what could end up happening is the engine computer is looking at how much air your mass airflow is detecting, but then it looks at the exhaust and looks at the oxygen sensor, and the oxygen sensor tells the computer, hey, wait, there's too much oxygen. Because of that, the computer starts making fuel trim adjustments, then the computer doesn't know what's going on, and it sets a check engine light. So it's always a good idea to do a quick visual just to make sure that the boots, the clamps, are all good and none of them have slipped off. The other thing you want to take a look at when you think you might have a mass airflow problem is remove the mass airflow itself. When you're looking at the mass airflow, in some instances, you're going to have a small little window just like this. Within that window, you want to take a quick little flashlight and look inside to make sure there's no debris. We've seen stuff such as flies, insects, getting stuck or lodged inside the mass airflow. Think of it as putting a blanket over the thermistor so then now the sensor itself is underestimating the amount of air and then we have X amount coming out of the tailpipe so then the computer senses an airflow imbalance and then sets a check engine light for that. One common practice that comes with mass airflows is using mass airflow cleaner or alcohol on a cotton swab to clean off the thermistor. One, th one thing we recommend as professionals is using the cleaning method as part of your troubleshooting tree. What we mean by that is go ahead and take some cleaner, clean the mass airflow, let it air dry before you plug it back in, and then go ahead and retest the vehicle. If at that point you notice that the vehicle is running in a better state than it was prior, then we would suggest recommending the mass airflow. I know I'm going to get a lot of people in the comments saying, well, why not just clean it and send it on its way? Here's why. I've done this in the past and it wasn't a great experience. The customer took the vehicle and returned a few days later with the same trouble code. And when I retested the sensor, the sensor was either faulty, defective, or still underestimating the amount of air. Then I needed to actually replace it. This in the customer's eyes looks like we were trying to take advantage of them or the customer is going to think that we didn't know what we were doing when it came time to actually test their vehicle. For that same reason, we always recommend cleaning it as part of your diagnostic, and if it fixes the vehicle, then recommend replacing it. This way, you're confident as a technician or as a consumer that your vehicle was properly repaired and you're not gonna have a comeback later on down the road for that same sensor. A common thing that a lot of technicians were taught and we still teach this for some instances, is when in doubt, take it out. So what that means, if you think the mass airflow might be your problem, you can probably go and plug it and see how the vehicle operates. I've seen some YouTube content in particular where some people are stating that if I unplug the mass airflow and the vehicle runs a certain way, it's automatically the mass airflow. In some instances, this is true, and some, this is not. It all depends on the vehicle itself. If the manufacturer actually preset within the engine computer a default strategy, which means that if that sensor is missing, which is a mass airflow here, the engine can still operate under certain conditions. That's not always true on all vehicles. So you want to make sure that if you do unplug the mass airflow and the vehicle dies, don't automatically say that the mass airflow needs to be replaced. This just means that you need to do a little bit more research to make sure that this vehicle does have a backup strategy. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go ahead and unplug the mass airflow, and let's see what this Toyota does once I do that. So if you can tell, this vehicle stalled. It doesn't have any faults with the mass airflow at this time, but if we were going based off of this YouTube myth that's going around, then at this point, we could say that we need to replace the mass airflow. I'm gonna go ahead and start the vehicle back up, and then we're gonna see if the computer does have a backup strategy to take over even though the mass airflow is disconnected. Starting the vehicle back up, you can see that the vehicle actually started up. The PCM is gonna be looking at other sensor inputs, plus it also already has an adaptive strategy built in. As you drive your vehicle, your vehicle is actually learning how to operate itself based off of the way you drive. So with this sensor being out of the equation, the engine computer already knows what it should be doing for fuel control, injector on time, and ignition based off of previous drive cycle parameters. So with that, you wanna make sure that if you ever do the unplug test and the vehicle dies, it's not a bad mass airflow. Go ahead and start the vehicle up and see if the vehicle will operate. 
If the vehicle starts up and operates way different than prior to you unplugging the mass airflow, then more than likely you do have a mass airflow issue. I'm not saying that go ahead and replace the mass airflow. This just means you need to do some further testing to verify that that mass airflow actually needs to be replaced. Another thing we do as technicians is we look at scan tool data. What I have here right now is I have my calculated load and my mass airflow being graphed on my scan tool. The reason why I'm graphing is so I can look at it as a picture. It's much easier for me to see any dropouts or glitches within the mass airflow. Now, you might have heard that you can do the one-to-one -one rule. What this is, is for every one liter of engine size, you should have one gram per second on your mass airflow. Now, I have heard that this is not a good tool to use on any engine 3.0 or lower. How I usually play it is I'm still gonna use that as a starting point, but I'm not gonna use that as a solidified diagnostic. This is because I still need to have an idea of where I need to go with my evaluation or my diagnosis, and this is probably one of the better ways to do it. So if I have a 2.4 liter engine, I should be somewhere between 2.4 to 3.0 grams per second with the engine at idle. So being right now that this vehicle is at idle, I have 2.25 grams per second, meaning that the mass airflow is underestimating just a small amount, but nothing too bad where it's gonna set a check engine light. I have seen some cars though, particularly a 5.3 that came in one day, and it was measuring about 7.5 grams per second. Because this vehicle is naturally aspirated and not turbocharged, it'd be really difficult for it to be having that much air coming in. Once we ran a volumetric efficiency test, we were able to determine that the mass airflow was the problem. We recommended replacing it to the customer and that took care of the problem. So always make sure that we're looking at our data so this way we are 100% sure that that mass airflow is working the way it should be or if it's not, if that's actually the cause. Another way you can actually test your mass airflow is by using an oscilloscope. You're gonna look up a wiring diagram and find which one is your signal from the mass airflow to the engine computer, PCM. You're gonna take your oscilloscope, you're gonna back probe that signal or pierce it, but if you do pierce it, make sure you guys use some sort of liquid electric tape or enamel nail polish to seal that hole back up. Once you guys do that, what you're gonna do is you're gonna do a full snap throttle acceleration. During that snap, your initial rise of air should be over three and a half preferably, just like Mr. Scanner Danner says, at least four volts. This is gonna tell you that the mass airflow is properly detecting the right amount of incoming air, and you can consider that mass airflow in good shape. The other thing you can do as a quick reference before you start jumping into some major testing would do a wide open throttle acceleration. While looking at your scan tool data, if you have a PID known as calculated load, the engine computer is actually looking at various sensor inputs making a calculation and giving us a percentage value. If I do a wide open throttle acceleration with the vehicle in park and standing still, I should get over 90% calculated load. If I'm not reaching over 90% calculated load, there's a high probability that your mass airflow might be the cause for that particular situation. So at this point, you would have to run more tests to then determine if the mass airflow is your actual problem. With that being said, guys, before you guys jump into replacing a mass airflow, make sure you guys run some of the tests that I just talked about. So this way you can be 100% sure that the mass airflow is going to be correcting your problem. I don't want you guys going out there and spending a lot of money on a mass airflow, and it might not be the actual problem that you might be looking for. On the next video, I'm gonna show you guys how to do a volumetric efficiency test. So this way you can determine rather quickly, is this really a breathing problem, a mechanical problem, or is this a fuel delivery problem? And all this really requires is you driving around, collecting some data, and then punching it into a calculator, and that's gonna guide you to which direction you need to take your initial diagnostic. If you found this information useful, go ahead and do me a huge favor. Give us a like, put in the comments what information was really helpful to you, make sure that you guys hit the subscribe button, and turn on your notifications so you get a ding every time we drop a new video. And as always, guys, a good technician's always learning. I'll see you guys on the next one.